Yeah, I mean, so I guess we'll be talking mainly today about uh, conceptual spaces and your book with the same title, The Geometry of Thought, as a subtitle. Uh, so for anyone uh, listening to the podcast who thinks that might sound familiar, it's because Kuhn and I, Kuhn Forlis is a fellow PhD student in our lab, we discussed this book already in a few parts. Uh, we kind of, uh, it sounded very interesting, so went through it in several steps. So yes, this is the same book, uh, and now I'm talking to the author, which is very exciting. Yeah, I think I'd like to kind of just go th not through the book, but like discuss it uh, quite broadly and the topics um, that you discuss there. And I thought I really like the way you start in the book. So you do discuss kind of the two goals of cognitive science and kind of how conceptual spaces and your book fits into that. Um, could you maybe could we maybe start there? Yeah, I, I think of myself as a cognitive scientist, so that's where the book should be located. I mean, I have a background mainly in, in mathematics and philosophy. I've studied some linguistics. Uh, uh, I've dabbled in psychology, uh, and uh, I don't know very much about neuroscience, but I have some inklings on, on what's going on. So it's, it's a book basically written for cognitive scientists, maybe a little bit for philosophers who are interested in, in the knowledge representation problems, uh, maybe a little bit for computer scientists who want to know something about how we could possibly represent the information not in the symbolic uh, type of, uh, of way. So, yeah, I hope that gives a description of what I think of my, as my audience. Yeah, yeah. And um, what, yeah, maybe, I mean, I thought I'd do this later, but maybe I'll just switch to it right now. I mean, you had this this very nice sentence in the, in the beginning of your book. I think I'll just read it out briefly because it kind of, I think it's a very nice metaphor. Uh, you said, while writing this text, I felt like a centaur standing on four legs and waving two hands. The four legs are supported by four disciplines, philosophy, computer science, psychology, and linguistics, and there's a tale of neuroscience. Since these disciplines pull in different directions, in particular when it comes to methodological questions, there is considerable risk that my centaur has ended up in a four-legged split. And uh, first of all, I just very like, I very much like that image. I, um, I've totally forgotten that quote. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, the, the, the thing I wanted to ask, which is basically the, the, the funny thing kind of when, when I discussed this book with Kuhn is that both of us come more from the neuroscience side. And we very much, uh, I'm very, we're very much interested in spatial navigations and grid cells and all these kind of things. And I found out about you by reading the review paper where you're co-author in science uh, with Jakob Elmont as first author. And so I always, I just assumed like, oh, cool, here's someone who's already written about all of these things uh, from a philosophical perspective. And so I was really surprised then to see that, you know, neuroscience isn't one of the four legs of this book. <laughs> um, and then in particular that you basically cited none of the spatial navigation literature, which to me was... I, I thought it was like so. Uh, I thought it was going to be central to the book. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, th this book was written, you know, basically twenty-five years ago, pu published in in two thousand, and at that time I had very little knowledge about spatial navigation. Uh, a lot of the experiments, I mean, Moses' work was was hardly there, and uh, that was O'Keefe uh, O'Keefe's work, and so on. I knew a little bit about it basically, but I was. Just too afraid to write too much about the uh, about the uh, neuroscience in the book because I I wrote a little bit about topographic mappings and that that's about it uh, that I that put in the book so it's it's more written for computer scientists and psychologists and, and philosophers as, as I said yeah 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 you're, you're obviously right that this was before the discovery of grid cells and all this kind of thing and the Morses I guess had kind of just gotten going in that sense but. Uh, yeah, so it's it's basically um, yeah. I guess what I find fascinating is it seems there were like these two parallel literatures almost um, that develop very similarly to kind of suggesting that conceptual space is something very useful. Without, I guess now they're starting in part. Yeah, they're, they're starting to overlap, but I guess not before that. Yeah, I mean it was it was Jacob Elman who con contacted me and said that he found my my theory is interesting because he thought that it could be used to explain what the hippocampus is doing when it's not doing spatial navigation. Now, that is, it's navigating in other spaces, I mean, in other conceptual uh, spaces. So, so he, we, we joined efforts in, 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 in writing this. Well, he did most of the job, but anyway, I, I, I helped him in, in getting this uh, areas of conceptual spaces right and so on, yeah. Yeah, and uh, there I've talked to Jakob on the podcast, so there's an entire episode about... Uh half an episode about that paper. Um, I guess we've already mentioned conceptual space and that stuff, but what are they? We haven't really talked about what, what they are. What is a conceptual space and what does it do? 
It's a way of using space. I mean, I, I take this mathematical concept uh, quite literally. I mean, it's a set of dimensions with, with a metric um, that I use to represent information in different domains. And so my paradigm example is color space, but you can have, you can have size, you can have temperature, you can have weight, you can have sound, uh, or maybe some social structures can be represented in, in various spatial structures. And uh, in, in the book, I try to develop this idea uh, to say a little bit about how you can do it mathematically, leaving lots of things open, uh, but also how that, how that can be used to understand various aspects of concept learning and, and uh, uh, inductive reasoning and, uh, and, and semantic questions. Since I wrote the book, I have continued on in the area of semantics quite a lot. Yeah, I think I'll ask a few more detailed questions about semantics uh, later on, uh, because that's a topic I know basically nothing about. Um, so I guess that's where I can learn the most. But uh, yes, I mean, what do, um, or maybe you, you talked about two different, uh, you talk about these three levels of representation, uh, symbolic, um, associ associated, I keep forgetting how it's pronounced, associationist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neural, yeah. neural network space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you kind of place conceptual spaces between them as a, as a bridge, as you call it. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Kind of what's the, um, why, uh, kind of if we already have these other two levels of representation, why do we need conceptual spaces and how does it kind of bridge them? I mean, I was, I was brought up in philosophy department using logical symbolism and I, and I learned to program using symbols. So I was, my background was in, in doing uh, knowledge representations in terms of symbols, uh, either logical formulas or computer programs. Uh, uh, but then I started studying AI, and I, I realized there were lots of problems with, with uh, using these symbolic representations. And um, at the time, the neural networks were, were being developed, and they could solve certain problems. They could learn to recognize patterns. They can learn to circumvent the symbolic constraints. Uh, I mean, you have to don't have to define them in, uh, at the beginning and, and, and so on. They can learn very basic things. But the drawback of neural networks is that, uh, first of all, you don't know exactly what they are learning. Secondly, they are learning very slowly. Uh, you need a lot of training, lots of examples. You have to feed them lots of data in, in order for them to pick up some reasonable pattern. And I knew a little bit about how children learn new words and learn new concepts, and it goes very quickly. And the question is, how can we learn things so quickly? I mean, if, if, if the world needs to have some structure. So then I came up with this idea that if we sort up the world in, in some kind of geometrical structures where we have dimensions and spaces and so on, then it's quite easy to explain how, how uh, learning goes so quickly and that why we only need a couple of examples of the meaning of a word to, in order to understand it. We don't need to train thousands of times as a neural network does. So it, it was a way of trying to amplify the way of um, uh, representing knowledge. Uh, and I put it in between because that's a question of le level of granularity. I mean, given the conceptual spaces, you can identify word meanings as regions in the spaces. And you can learn, you can train neural networks to generate those regions. So from a much lower, lower and fine, more fine-grained uh, uh, levels. So in terms of well, basically, the granularity of representation, uh, conceptual spaces come in between the symbolic level and the uh, uh, neural network level. One question I had whilst I was thinking about this is, I was almost really surprised that the conceptual level hadn't been described first. Um, and I kind of had this question, like, why it took so long for someone to propose this? Because when I, I just thought back about, because basically, you know, it's, it's you know, you, I guess you just say we, we sought our world or not we sort it but like we describe our world by different quality dimensions and we'll get a bit to into a bit more data what that means later but i mean that's basically what you do when you learn mathematics in in high school when you're you know 10 12 years old or whatever right that, that's basically what you do you learn oh yeah this can there can be a dimension and then you can plot it on a graph and etc right so i was kind of really surprised that this 
hadn't already happened like 300 years ago, basically. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the, the history behind it is that in, in philosophy, logic was so dominant. I mean, the, the symbolic representations, that was dominant as, as a way of describing reasoning and as representing knowledge. Everybody thought that we could catch all, all knowledge there is in, in, in logical formulas. And then in, in computer science, it was the same thing. We had these symbolic uh, languages before there were neural networks. The psychologists were doing things with dimensions. So I, I borrowed some ideas from them. And there are people uh, like Shepard and Nosovsky who, are, who are, have been working with, with spatial representations. But what I added to that was a little bit more focus on the geometry. So um, I, I have one of the central notions in, in my book is that of dividing a space into regions and saying that for a natural concept, uh, the, the region should be convex. And this idea of convexity, I haven't found in any other psychologist. And for me, that has given a lot of mileage in terms of uh, explanatory power. Okay, so what is convexity? Maybe that's something, uh, some, some one specific term I do need to ask about. What exactly does that mean? Convexity means that if, one, if two points X and Y are both in the set, in, in, a, in, in a set, then anything in between is also in the set. So if you call one color shade for, by red the term red and another color shade by the term red, any shade in between will also be called red. That's the, uh, the, the official definition of, of convexity. It relies on the notion of betweenness. But if you have a space, you can typically talk about betweenness. Mm -hmm. And how, how does convexity exactly help, help us? Like what? Yeah. Um, there are many reasons why convexity helps us. Maybe the most important one is it's easy to learn because if you have learned a couple of examples of what is meant by uh, and red is not a good good example by uh, but by um, an animal, you've seen a couple of examples of, of a peculiar animal, and then you know that anything that is similar, to anything that is in between. I mean, this is kind of principle for generalization of observations you've already had. So if, if you have convexity, you can generalize to new instances. So that helps explain why learning goes so quickly. Mm. So basically, as soon as you've acquired a few examples, you can infer whether something belongs to this category yeah. or not. And it also fits very nicely with what's called prototype theory in, in uh, psychology. I mean, people say that we can't define concepts by necessary and sufficient conditions. That's what philosophers want to do. But um, we, we rather have prototype. There's a prototypical bird, there's a typical fruit, there's a typical piece of furniture, and, and, and so on. And once you have learned the prototype, then you can generalize. I mean, if you, if there, if you want to know whether something is an orange or an apple, then you, you check whether it's more similar to an orange than to an apple, and then you decide it must be an orange yeah? because it's more similar. So you talk about distances and the space here. So um, and, you, and prototypes then are, are the centers of these convex regions. To, uh, that's uh, another connection here to convexity. Yeah, I really liked the prototypes. I mean, we can maybe use the example that you um, use in the... In the, in the science review with Jakob Belmont, because I think that's a very nice uh, example where you have basically your two axes are the horsepower of a car and the other axis is the weight of a car. And so um, basically, if you have these two axes, you can map all sorts of different cars. So if you have a very heavy, very powerful car, it's, I mean, car in the loose sense here, it's, it's probably a lorry or a truck or something like that. If you have a very powerful, very light car, it might be something like a Formula One car or something like that. And then you can really find this. And yeah, maybe can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Because I really, I thought, I mean, it's, it's slightly harder to describe. When you see it in front of you, it's much more obvious. Yeah, that, that's a kind of toy example, uh, because two dimensions for cars are not sufficient. But you can get a rough sorting of, of certain. And maybe maybe the size or the power is not, uh, maybe it's the shape of the car or something like that that's, um, that goes um, uh, into the central uh, part of what is meant by a car or a truck. And it's known that, when children learn words for new objects, new categories, they are very much biased towards shape. So the, if things are similar in shape, they sort them by shape. And then they learn that maybe some other aspects like sound or um, living be behavior or something like that is, is more important for the categorization. But if you sort things by shape, you do quite well and you can learn a lot of words by just yeah. looking at the shapes. <laughs> yeah, it's a fair point. I guess shape is the... It's probably the, the dimension that gives you like the, 
the most bang for your buck when you want to differentiate different kinds exactly. of animals. Exactly, and kids are tuned to that, to that economy, conceptual economy, we can call it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And only once you become a bit older, you really need all these like details that don't really matter that much. Um, yeah, maybe to to take a little bit of a of a step back. I'm kind of I'm always curious like about how people got into the research that they that they're doing. Um and I'm in your case I'm particularly interested because I looked at your early publications and it looked like it was more kind of I mean some of the stuff looked like stuff I read from for my direct research which it looks more like game theory a bit of like fairness and all these kind of things and then that kind of gradually peters out kind of until by the 90s it seems like you're not really doing that much anymore so I'm curious like how do you it it seemed quite different um and yeah, yeah. how did you end up there I I wrote my PhD thesis on decision making and that's why the game theory comes in and and stuff like that but I've always been interested in knowledge representation I mean I I I was educated as a program I did some AI programs in in Lisp during my my bachelor work and so on and I got interested in how how can we solve new problems with using AI and then in philosophy of science, one of the major problems is uh, the problem of induction. How can we go for observations of that certain uh, ravens are, are black to a generalization that all ravens are black? What do we need? And so on. And there are famous paradoxes in induction. So Carl Hempel has said that, okay, if we observe a, a raven that, that is black, that supports for the for the um, generalization that all the ravens are black. But he says that if we observe a, a, a brown shoe that is not a raven, then they, that, that's also support because logically they are, they are we, we, they, that support for the, for the um, generalization that every non-black thing is non-raven. Yeah, exactly. And uh, logically these are, uh, these are equivalent. And pe- people in the uh, logical traditions have been arguing for how this should be solved so i got my question was how can we determine whether a concept is natural so non-black is not very natural or non-raven is definitely not a natural concept induction concerns um, relations between natural concepts so what you mean by natural well something that we can that we can do, do generalizations about um, and the, another famous uh, paradox is goodman paradox and he says that we can say that something is grew if it's green before 2025 and blue after 2025. So all the evidence we have says that all, all emeralds, they're not only green, but they also grew. Uh, and we don't expect them to change color when 2025 comes. So being grew is not a natural pre- predicate, but green is a natural predicate. How do we make a distinction? And that's why I came up with this idea that if we look at a geometric representation, we can say that the natural uh, concepts, they are the convex ones. And uh, some, some uh, of these non-raven will not be convex region. And, and uh, I have argued in the book that GRU is not a convex region either. So uh, if we want to have some kind of explanation of why we generalize from certain concepts and not from others, then I think the geometry would play right. So that was actually my starting point. But then I be- began reading about uh, how children learn concepts and so on. I found more and more support for this idea and, uh, that convexity could be a good idea to uh, define what is a natural concept, that the concept that we have words for, so to speak. So that's totally de- devoted from neuroscience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that's that's kind of you know uh, why I find this fascinating. I mean, one of my last episodes I published was was with Daniela Schiller, and one thing we talked about there is that she comes so from the if you're from neuroscience, there's usually these two perspectives. One is of the hippocampus. One is memory. Um, you know, you have procedural memory or episodic memory for, you know, events in your life. And there's the, you know, HM, the amnesic patient is the most famous example there. And then there's this other entire literature, this other approach, which is coming more from, you know, the special navigation that you have play cells on the hippocampus and that kind of stuff. And it's really interesting to me that you have a, basically a third approach to this whole. Well, well, yes and no, because. We, we can say, I mean, this is the idea in the paper with Bellman that uh, the hippocampus is not doing only spatial representations of ordinary space, but it's doing spatial representations of all other kinds of things. So we have codes for colors and for shapes and, and whatnot, and, and uh, they are represented differently in the, um, in the place cells, but 
the, the idea is that the grid cells function as a kind of universal universal coordinate system. So that, that's uh, that's how we how we can do these uh, spatial uh, representations. Then how this really connects to episodic memory is another step. But we can at least say something about how the different concepts are coded. That we that we our memories sometimes are more or less similar to the real things and so on. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I meant I forgot to say like that. The that all of this points towards what in neuroscience we think of as these well conceptual spaces to use your term now <laughs> um that that yeah exactly this spatial navigation system it might just be a coincidence that we happen to find spatial navigation versus navigation in other kinds of spaces or we kind of physical spatial navigation rather than any other kind of conceptual space yeah i mean i thought maybe we could talk a little bit more about um to kind of make this a little bit more concrete about the different dimensions i mean since you mentioned color already and you use it you know frequently in the book as an example and I, maybe one thing I, I find it an interesting example because in a way color seems like it might not apply that well to your theory in, in some ways because for color we have this really weird thing that we perceive it kind of as a circle rather than as a line that goes from a to b even though the electromagnetic spectrum does go from a to b and i mean one thing i already mentioned in our book discussion is that um this is ex when you edit photos uh, on software, you have this color wheel. It, it looks exactly like the, the image you have in your book. Um, I'm just curious, do you, uh, one just general question I had, are there other kind of dimensions that don't really match the, the, the representation, the, the way it actually is in reality, so to speak? So like, you know, with color, like why, for example, is sound linear? or more or less linear, at least it goes from A to B, but color is a circle. Like, why doesn't sound, like, suddenly, when you have very high notes, suddenly it becomes a low note? Like, are there other examples like that? Um, good question. First of all, I should say that I picked the color space as a good, an example because it's well-researched, and we know the distances in the space. I mean, people, the psychologists have been asking people to compare color chips and ask how similar are they and so on. And based on various techniques like multidimensional scaling, they have established that we have this kind of three-dimensional room, uh, three-dimensional perception of colors. And if you do that with, with cows, you only get a two-dimensional space because they can't make the red-green uh, discrimination. And if you do it with some birds or fish, then you get uh, end up with a four-dimensional space. They can, for instance, make a distinction between a mixture of blue and yellow and a green. Why we can't make that distinction in our perceptual space. So it's a kind of empirical finding that the human color space is three-dimensional. And it partly depends on what receptors we have. I mean, some animals have more color receptors than we have. And there is some kind of theory of how we get, go from the three different receptors color receptors to the color perception it's also the black and white uh, receptors of course uh, but the, we end up with this kind of complementary color so so uh, blue is opposite to orange and, and and so on in our perception we get this color circle which is which is odd you ask for other examples and it's not that easy for me to give examples but on, if you talk about sounds uh, we can talk about harmony space, and harmony is is very interesting because that depends on patterns between the frequencies. So you get the kind of th things. Some certain things are harm harmonious if the if the frequencies match in, in multiples, so to speak. I mean, an octave is double the frequency, and 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 and, and so on. But the, they they sound very similar. They are very similar. I mean, two two tones that. Are distinguished by an octave, they sound exactly similar, even if they are uh, there is a um, certain um, uh, certain distance in, in frequency. So there, you also have that kind of of similarity doesn't fit with with the um, uh, Hertz uh, representation of sound. It's funny that um, I just mentioned sound as as the counter example to color. And I mean, I did lots of music in my teenage years and know lots of music theory and all this kind of stuff. And it's funny that the one example I chose that I should have known about <laughs> is the one that is, doesn't actually fit either. Um, yeah. yeah, but you're very right. Yeah, of course, of course, an, an octave is... I mean, of course, you, you, you do go up continuously, but then you do get these like weird jumps in there where suddenly things seem more similar than other things. Huh. But yeah, I mean, if you don't have an answer to this question, I can just take it out. But like, why is it <laughs> like one? It's just kind of wouldn't it be more efficient to just code these things in a linear way every time? 
like I just it just it just seems like a really weird oddity that we have these dimensions that seem to exist as continuous variables uh, in the outside world and then we we structure it so differently in our mind and somehow it seems weird to me that some of the most basic dimensions seem to be coded in such a weird way or is there like a really benefit to it like yeah that's a very good question for color i don't have any clue to why we end up with this kind of color circle what that helps us doing uh, um, there must be some kind of ecological explanation for it i mean we talk about warm and cold colors i mean the red and yellow are warm and the green and blue are, are cold there is some kind of ecology to that i mean the, the warm things tend to be red and yellow and cold things tend to be blue and yellow blue and uh, green uh, and there could be some reason for why they are grouped together maybe there are other reasons for why we ended up with it in, in a circle uh, it's a tough question, but um, I guess there might be some explanations for for, for that. Uh, uh, when it comes to sound, uh, think about how you recognize a vowel. A vowel is dependent on not on the frequency. I can say a high A and I can say a low A, uh, but it's the, the, the pattern between the overtones that determines that it's an A and not an O. So th there, there is more a pattern of frequencies rather than rather than the absolute frequencies that determine vowels uh, and uh, how we identify vowels. So um, uh, I don't know if that's enough of a reason, but um, it's, the, it's the relations between the frequencies that are more important in, in, in our perception of sound than the, the, in the, uh, the absolute frequencies. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to think about it, but I can't. I can't <laughs> say anything intelligent to it. It's just. It's something I hadn't thought about, but now I realize that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably think of something really smart to say, like tomorrow morning or something. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, 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 the harmony space is quite interesting. I, I had a look into it. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I should. I uh, should invite someone on to do. I mean, I, I have done some music episode. Well, not not really actually, but I want to do some music episodes in the future. Uh, but yeah, but that's a that's a separate conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, so to to continue talking about dimensions a little bit, I mean, one question is, of course, um, oh, one question to me is like, what which dimensions do you encode automatically? I mean, this maybe goes a little bit into neuroscience, um, and uh, you know, as you said, it's maybe not your, your the strongest point. But um, one thing I at least naturally wonder about is kind of which dimensions do you encode at what time and that kind of thing because in, in principle you can you can take every dimension you can think of and apply it to an object sometimes that might not make sense but you can still kind of try and do it or whatever but is it yeah how do you kind of decide which dimensions to encode mentally or neurally is it just what's whatever's relevant in the context or is there any any more to it uh that's a very good question and, and quite complicated i mean uh, William James said famously that the child, the, the newborn child perceives the world as a blooming, buzzing confusion. So it's, it's just a lot of sensory in, in input. And then the child has to make sense of this. And one of the first things is to uh, establish the spatial relations. So we, we learn to pick up spatial structures quite early. And then we learn, of course, to coordinate the hand with the, with the hand movements, with our perception of the hands. We can direct our hands and, and, and so on. Uh, but that's the motor coordination. Um, but the child learns to separate more and more dimension. And then one famous example is Piaget's example of, of conservation. He pours lemonade in, in, in a narrow glass, and then he pours it in a wide glass, and he asks the child which is the... Which, Lemonade, do you prefer? And the child always take the, 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 the narrow glass, but the, because the lemonade looks higher. So for the for the child, the height of, of the of the lemonade is the determining what is most. And it takes some time before it realizes that that there is this vo dimension of volume that is con constant for for a liquid. So it has to add this volume uh, into its representation of, of things in the world. So that's a dimension that you're definitely not born with, but you, we are, you learn by, via your experience with food and sand and water and uh, lots of things that have volume, that, they, that the volume is very often conserved. That's the con conservation uh, principle. Uh, 
and then you, you use that dimension as a part. And then we, when we get to school, we learn about a lot of dimension from physics and, uh, and uh, chemistry and, and other things. We learn to, to perceive the world in, in, in new ways. I, there is no finite list of dimensions that we sort the world where we learn new things. We learn social dimensions like uh, hierarchies or uh, kinship relations and, 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 and things like that. We don't perceive them, but we have to learn them from social, uh, social relations. So in my book, I mainly use the perceptual dimensions because that's where we know something about the underlying structure. But our thinking is full of different domains of thinking, different where we have different kinds of dimensions. And for many of these, we know nothing about how they are structured men- mentally. Maybe studies of hippocampus can help us here, but uh, that's for the future. <clears throat> okay. Um, I have one question that kind of, I mean, so this is maybe a bit of a technical question, uh, but I, but I'm, I'm just genuinely curious because I don't know what the answer to this uh, is. It's basically, uh, as I was like reading your book and thinking about it and, and talking to about it, I had this question of like, so, I mean, the, 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 as you mentioned, one of the key parts of, the theory of conceptual spaces is this idea of metrics and that you can calculate distances between them. And, you know, you, you show that this can, you can have all sorts of, I mean, we've, we've mainly talked about uh, Euclidean space implicitly. Um, at least we've talked about that so far, but you can have all sorts of different kinds of spaces. You can have uh, uh, like a, a graph theory, a graph uh, structure or all sorts of things. One question I have is kind of like, can you, can you combine these or does it even make sense to calculate distances over different kind of metrics so what i was thinking about for example like let's say i want to see am i more similar to my older uncle or to my infant nephew you have these like two different dimensions right one is the the continuous linear height and Mm -hmm. uh, sorry age age um and i guess you also have height difference but um i was thinking of age and the other is you have this like family tree structure where um you know i'm related to this degree to that person or that person and it seems to me like I can ask that question and I can try and calculate some sort of distance in my head by asking who I'm more similar to, but it doesn't really make sense to, to calculate across those dimensions that much, really. Um, I was just curious, like, is it, uh, does that, does it work to, like, you know, have a, one dimension is a graph and the other is a continuous one or like, yeah, how does that yeah, I mean, there are many concepts where, where you can combine different metrics, of course, and then, uh, then it's difficult to, co- to judge similarity. But in general, similarity is not, not something that is fixed, but similarity is very much dependent on, on, on the context. So uh, if, uh, if you are in the music context, then a piano is more similar to a flute than it is to an armchair. But if you are in the, in the context of moving, uh, moving from one apartment to another one, then the piano is more similar to the armchair than to the flute. So uh, the, the context depends, the, the decides what are the relevant, or most salient dimensions, as I, I, as I call them. And that will determine what, what is judged similar in, 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 in a particular situation. So similarity is, is definitely context relative. Uh, so the example I gave, for example, you would, uh, one would say, okay, like, if I want to figure out who I'm more similar to, what's what do you care about? Like, what's the relevant dimension here? Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about sharing clothes, then the height is much more similar than, I mean, much more important than the kinship relations. But if you think about whom to invite to a party or to a wedding or whatever, then maybe kinship is is the more the more relevant dimension here. Okay. Okay. Um... But would it work like mathematically to calculate distances across these different things or uh yeah yeah i mean if 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 you have distances i mean in the graphs you don't have distances but if you have distances you can put weights on them I and mean, it's just a matter of weight weighing the different uh, domains um, so then you can change uh, change the um, the salience of the of the dimensions but in general i mean combining metric spaces with graphs is uh, I, uh, there i don't have a clear answer to you okay yeah yeah I, I could maybe say something about the, the metrics because and yeah. most people think about spaces as Euclidean spaces. Uh, but it turns out that uh, that's not obvious when you look at how we perceive things. And if you take the color, color space, 
then we need to actually already there a polar coordinate because it's a circle. And we, are, we have to look at the, the similarity is determined by the angles, not by the absolute uh, Euclidean distance. So for describing the color space, there is one polar dimension and then there is this orthogonal uh, dimension for, from black to white. So it's a combination there. Maybe you could do it as a sphere. I mean, that would be another way of representing colors. And then you would have total uh, polar coordinates. I don't know which is empirically the best uh, way to do it. But since I wrote the book, I've, I've been working uh, on different aspects of semantics. And and uh, I worked uh, wrote a paper with a Dutch um, linguist, uh, Joost Swartz, on prepositions. And it turned out in order to understand things like in front of and, and uh, to the left of and, and uh, above and so on, it's much better to use polar coordinates than to use uh, Euclidean ones. So we actually use po polar thinking for for uh, for the, uh, our understanding prepositions. Uh, so it's not obvious that the Euclidean space is the the most natural way of, of how we think. Yeah, I found that aspect really interesting and. Um... Yeah, I mean, one one question I kind of had there was whether I don't know whether this is exactly a criticism of it or not, but basically one question I kind of had is like it seemed to me like it's it's kind of difficult to falsify um, or to find evidence against your theory in the sense that you can always kind of argue like well you're using the wrong metric or the wrong kind mm -hmm. of space you're using the wrong uh, distance calculation or whatever um, is I mean is this something you've you've thought about much or I, I, I thought that. I thought about it, but it gets, it's a kind of difficult problem because it takes a lot of empirical investigations. I mean, that's why I use the color space because it's fairly well established. But still, people are fighting about whether um, the RGB or the uh, NCS system is the best representation of, of color perception. And they have slightly different geometry. All, all of them have three dimensions that, that they have in common. And uh, I, I just picked the color spindle as a, as a simple example of representing the, uh, the colors. But you can falsify it because if you really do hard work on people's similarity judgments, I mean, how, how do I judge similarity between colors? Then you can make the distinctions between, between these spaces. But so far, I mean, there they, they are, they are very small differences. So th there is a best empirical explanation. And I think... My case for prepositions is actually easier because prepositions carve out quite quite nice areas of the space. Uh, I mean, being in front of is just a uh, yeah, particular area of space, being behind and so on, to the left of. And, and these carvings out are done in more or less and, and going around. And we, we have a lot of, lot of prepositions that depend on these polar coordinates. So the explanatory power of using polar coordinates is much larger for uh, prepositions than it is to use Euclidean uh, space to explain the meaning of prepositions. It's a well. It's a kind of indirect argument, but it still, it supports that the polar coordinates would be the, the natural uh, representation of space, of some spaces, of all of them. Yeah, yeah, some spaces. Yeah, yeah but yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm. By the way, just one thing I noticed. I guess I can tell that you on Sweden is a bit further north because it's already a lot darker for you. And for me, it's still. Like, yeah. I just realized that we yeah. started off roughly the same, and that's changed <laughs> like within an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to some extent, um, one thing I also wondered when I talked about falsifying is that it seemed to me that to some extent that the point of your book is more to provide a framework through which you can kind of view all of these things rather than a concrete, very specific testable theory that it's like yeah. super precise in that sense. No, I, I depend on a lot of psychological work here. I mean, in order to establish how, how perceptual spaces really look like. Yeah. And, and and maybe, I mean, work on hippocampus can be, be a way into that because if we know the code in the hippocampus, we can then maybe infer something about how we perceive things. I mean, there might be a fairly strong correlation between that. I mean, we know that the coding of space is quite good in, in the hippocampus. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess we've already talked a little bit about... Um... I mean, you just mentioned literally the, the old new work on semantics and that kind of stuff, and you published an entire book in 2014 called Geometry of Meaning, Semantics Based on Conceptual Spaces. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I know nothing about semantics, 
so maybe uh, this is something where I can, as I said, learn, the, learn probably the most from you, uh, because <laughs> there's yeah, it's, it's a blank slate right now. You can just paint whatever you want onto it. <laughs> um, I was curious. One, I don't. I, I think you probably mentioned this in the book. Um, I don't think that I just came up with this, um, but it's. Um, I, I can't remember. I think it's in the semantics chapter. Um, basically, the the relationship between aspects or how different semantic concepts fit onto different parts of your theory so for example that adjectives are basically the quality dimension so if something is uh you know i mean i guess red is maybe not color is maybe not the best example here but if someone if, if someone is a nice person then you can think of that as a continuous dimension and you know it's one of the quality dimensions um is it then is it am i correct then in assuming that nouns um if you want to think of it that way are basically these prototypes in this space? Well, that's exactly what I do in, in this book, The Geometry of Meaning. That I, I want to explain why we have different word classes. I mean, the main word classes are nouns, adjectives, verbs, and prepositions. Uh, uh, there are lots of, uh, not lots, but a few other classes, but these are the main ones. And, and um, uh, if, if you study logic or computer science, then everything is a predicate, and you don't make a distinction there. So why do we have word classes? Well, they represent different kinds of things. And as you say, adjectives represent region of some single space. And that's, uh, I mean, the, the term red only concerns the color space. It doesn't concern time or shape or anything like that. So I put forward as a hypothesis that all adjectives only refer to a single uh, conceptual space or a single domain. And, uh, of course, that depends on having being able to identify domains. So it's... Uh, uh, it's a difficult hypothesis. And then nouns are combinations of properties from lots of domains. So a dog dog has a size and a shape and a smell and a sound and, and a weight and a temperature and a shape, uh, lots, of, lots of aspects. So nouns are characterized by having lots of properties and correlations between properties. And then I did some work on prepositions, and prepositions are basically spatial relations, but there are some... some um, Prepositions that depend on force, for instance, for example, uh, being on something is dependent on force, or being against something, leaning against something is dependent on forces. So it's not only the spatial dimensions, but also others. And then I did this, a lot of work, and I'm still working on verbs. And there are two kinds of verbs. And uh, one kind is uh, describing how you do something. They're called manner verbs. I'm, I'm hitting or kicking or, or licking. I mean, I'm, I'm performing an action. And then I describe actions as, as patterns of forces. That's my, my analysis. So I use the force dimension to analyze manner verbs. And then there are result verbs that describe what happens. Something gets heated, something is moved, something gets painted, and so on. There is a change of property from being not red to red if you're painted, painting it red, or from being cold, cold to war, hot if you're heating a soup, and, and, and so on. So I distinguish, I use the conceptual spaces and different structures on the conceptual spaces to distinguish between different, um, uh, different word classes. So that's one of the main themes in, in, in this book on, on the geometry of meaning. Okay, yeah. I was wondering about, I was just, as I said, like, I mean, I've, I've read the Conceptual Spaces book, but not the one on uh, semantics. And I was, yeah, I was really wondering, like, um, I, I, as I, I can't remember whether you mentioned this in this, in the Conceptual Spaces book, but I was really thinking about verbs because I was like, okay, it's not like for, for it seems to be for nouns and adjectives, it's a lot clearer what they would be. Um, but for verbs, I was like, I'm not entirely sure. And then uh, I was just curious, like, because the, 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 like, in, immediate answer i came with is that a verb is a change in space which i think corresponds roughly to some of the ones you said that's the result verbs yes i mean in 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 in, in conceptual spaces i didn't say very much about verbs at all but i that's an area where i worked quite a lot since since then mm. are there any verbs that don't fit into those two um, well, we don't talk about those <laughs> there are some abstract verbs that are difficult to handle i mean uh, like hypothesize uh, or what or... yeah exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> well, speculate what is that <laughs> yeah what is, yeah so so what do you do with those you just kind of say that you can't you can't catch them all or i i, I say i have no idea what is the underlying <laughs> okay. conceptual space so i skip them <laughs> yeah okay by the way how does that um i mean i guess if you talk about adjectives nouns and verbs that should probably be similar between swedish and english or german and french or whatever. oh yeah oh yeah, but yeah how does that are there any like 
uh, <laughs> again, I'm not assuming you know all the languages of the world, um, but are there any languages that uh, don't even aren't that where you can't even classify words into those concepts, or is that pretty universal? Or no, no, it's it's not. I mean, there are some basic differences actually, and and one of the cases I happen to know a little bit about is Mandarin. I mean, standard Chinese, where people are claiming some linguists are claiming that they don't make a distinction between adjectives and verbs. Huh? So they don't say the table is brown, but I say the table brown, so is browning. But on the other hand, there are linguists who say that, yes, we can make distinctions and so on. And then this distinction between the manner and result verbs, that's very clear in, in, in Mandarin. Uh, funny, this the distinction is that in, in, a, uh, in the European language, we only have one verb per basic sentence. Uh, so either you pick a manner verb, I, I, I hit you, or, or uh, we pick a result verb, you, you, you bleed. Uh, or we don't use both. We can have prepositional phrases saying something or adverbs doing the other part. I mean, you can but in Chinese, up, right? I walk and yeah, think. Yeah. yeah, we can, we can, yeah, we can do that. But that's that's a combination. But in Chinese, you can have both a manner verb and a result verb in the same sentence. Which is a bit odd for us. I was going to ask you for example, but I guess that doesn't work in English. But... No, I, 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 I can't do that. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just a, a yeah. Um, I guess it's one of those things where you just can't really provide good examples if we're talking in language. Uh, I, I should have, pre I should have prepared this, but I, I could find examples. Well, but I mean, but also I... in English, I guess you wouldn't have it, right? So it's yeah. Oh, well, I, something like it. It would be something like I hit you, bleed. Ah. That's not a grammatical sentence in English, but it's it's apparently something you can say in Mandarin. I mean, you can say "I hit you, comma you bleed." <laughs> I hit you, comma you bleed. That would yeah, but... yeah, quite, yeah. That, that's that's two sentences. That's two. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, okay, you're right. I'm I'm separating two main clauses here. Um, mm -hmm. I cheated. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm still trying to. It's funny, like I guess when I try and think about questions about semantics, one thing I'm very much constrained by is my lack of knowledge here about what I could <laughs> ask. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really weird. Like language is this thing that I I always say is the most boring thing in the world, but whenever I talk about it, I I tend to be quite interested. <laughs> so yeah, I have this very weird disconnect between how I think yeah. about it and how I actually seem to act about it. Yeah. Now, I mean, one interesting question that I have followed a bit is how children learn language. I mean, what concepts do you pick up first? Uh, and it turns out that I pick up nouns before adjectives, which seems odd because nouns are more complicated. On the other hand, nouns contain much more information and that's much more correlation between the dimensions. And learning that something is red or big means that you have to separate out this dimension from all these correlations. So uh, according to my theory, it's not a wonder that, that children are, have a preference for, for understanding or learning nouns to, to uh, adjectives. Mm. You mean like basically if... Yeah, like intuitively, you, you might think that you would learn uh, the the adjective red first because it's what it's a dimension or a space of a dimension, yeah, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> um, or height. Let's say that's easier. Uh, you you learn height, uh, mm -hmm. which is a noun, not an adjective. Uh, you <laughs> you learn tall. Let's use that. Now I found yeah, that's an adjective. I found, yeah, I, I found yes, an adjective. Yeah, um, because it's one dimension. It would be simpler, but you mean it's more. I mean, is it more that children just learn specific items to to find a sound they're, that corresponds they're, with they're, it? They're very good at picking out these correlations between properties. So mm. the, there, there are correlations between sounds and shapes of, of a cat. I mean, you have sounds and shape and uh, furriness and, and, and all these things go together, hang together. And these, these form an, a very natural cluster. But if you look at things that are red, I mean, there, there are... There are, there are uh, red flowers, there are red shoes, there are red fruits, there are red uh, everything. And how do you... How do you understand that what is common to this is, is the color? I mean, that's a, a more advanced and more abstract thinking. I mean, is it that you develop these dimensions to be able to differentiate between different almost... This is exactly that's what happens in Piaget's con con conservation task, that you learn to see the dimension of volume as a separate one. You learn to see the dimension of a color as a separate one from, from all the things that go together. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just curious again, like thinking about like, okay, we have these different types of words and how well they fit into your theory. I mean, is that then also, if, if something, let's say, doesn't fit in, is that then also, 
Yeah, I mean, is it kind of you, you try and see how far your theory takes you and how far you can fit it in, and then you say, okay, it doesn't work in this context, so something else is needed, or what do you do with that when you... you... Most, most of the problems I have is the, the problems that we don't know the underlying spaces. So I, I don't know how to analyze uh, what it is to speculate or what to hypothesize and so on. I mean, I don't know what these abstract spaces look like. So, uh, But for, for um, perceptual spaces, I think it works quite well. I mean, I... I it's it's more like a research program. I mean, and it and and the, and, and the good thing about it is that if these uh, ideas are correct, then that would explain a lot about how we learn um, uh, words as as a child. Some things are easier to learn than than others. And uh, if I can find a fairly nice fit between the order in which children learn words and how, how complicated they are to represent the conceptual spaces, I would be very happy. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you have a theory of what an article is, like the or an? And I guess that's a particularly a question because it's. I mean, so I'm only really familiar with Germanic and Romance languages. I yeah, don't really yeah. know any other. But one thing I have noticed that it seems like a lot of other languages. I think, for example, Turkish and I think maybe Chinese also. I can't remember. They don't use articles, as far as I can tell. No, no, no. Lots of lots of the um, Slavic languages, for instance, don't use articles. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I happen to know that articles have been derived out of demonstratives. I mean, this and that and here and there. I mean, these uh, uh, pointing words, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, and um, there are we, in in English or in, in Germanic languages we don't have very many uh, uh, demonstratives. Basically, these four I mentioned. I mean, here, there, and so on. Some languages. I mean, in English we have the old word of yonder, which means far away. I mean, here, there, and yonder. I mean, that's a tri tripartition. Many languages have lots of demonstratives, and I happen to have worked with a linguist from Croatia. Uh, Croatian is extremely rich in in in, in demonstratives. You can talk, talk about this color and that size and, and so on in terms of uh, demonstratives. And th in my opinion, that's a kind of compensation for not having not having articles. You say instead of saying the book, you say this book or that their book. I mean, that book, you say their book. And yeah, something like that. Uh, so uh, you can replace uh articles with with demonstratives uh in in, in in communicative functions. Okay, I didn't actually know the word demonstrative. I yeah, okay. <laughs> These are pointing pointing words. I mean, pointing in place, space, or in time, or in uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was funny. Like once, once whilst you mentioned it, I was like, yeah, I guess this is a different class of of word. Yep. Um, but they turn out to fit quite nicely in the conceptual spaces. Forward, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Again, with polar coordinates. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I'd like to ask a little bit. I don't know how much you can uh, say about this, but one th one kind of uh, question I had, or like one just uh, topic I was thinking about, is the idea of how well these conceptual spaces and the whole three levels of representation, how that fits in an evolutionary context, and once you apply it to different species. I mean, again, I know you're not an ecologist or anything like that. But uh, one thing I was curious, for example, is... Uh, well, I also saw you have this book called How Homo Becomes Sapiens on the Evo yeah. Evolution of Thinking. Mm -hmm. So I figured maybe you might know something about this. Um, again, I haven't read that uh, book, so I don't know what it's exactly about. But thinking about this kind of evolutionary context makes me wonder, like, whether, um, you know, do all species have all three levels? Uh, I'm assuming not. I think symbolic seems what we'd say is predominantly human. Uh, but maybe let's just start there. Like, is um, yeah. as, as a basic question, do you all species have uh, all levels of representation? And if not, is it like a hierarchy that you need to have the lower to have the higher? Or can you... Yeah. One with that. I mean, if I, if I simplify a lot, I mean, this is this is the hierarchy. You start with the the lowest level, where I mean, simple organisms react to certain certain triggers. I mean, you react to the amount of glucose in in water if you're an amoeba, and and then you direct yourself in that um, in, in that way. You don't need concepts. You just have to follow gradients. So gradients of light, gradients of food, gradients of butterflies follow gradients of pheromones so uh, it's a it's a very uh, simple mechanism there 
Then if you come to mammals and birds, they are definitely have concepts. They can categorize things and whether something is edible or non-edible, whether something is a predator or not predator, you learn that. And then only humans have a fully developed symbolic system of communication. There are some cases in animals uh, for instance, the, the vervet monkeys have three different symbols for, or three different sounds for three different kinds of predators, um, for eagle, for a leopard, and for python. And so they have, you can't really think of them as symbols because they are they're, they're too, too simple. But what we have learned is to have a system of communication where we have level, label, I'm sorry, we have learned to have a system of communication where we have labels for things. Animals have warning cries, and they have mating cries, and they have food cries, and so on, different sounds for different. But we can label things. We can take our categories, the concepts we form, the regions we, we develop in our, in our minds, and put labels on them. And then we can use uh, words, symbols, or signs, if you like, to communicate these label, labels and thereby uh, share our inner, inner worlds. So, so there, there is an evolutionary order, yes. Yeah, so you, so you can't... You can't get a conceptual level without the subconceptual level. No, this is my my claim. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, in the neural network uh, the community, would would uh, protest, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, but I guess it is an interesting. I mean, it it seems to me also to some extent that the the, the conceptual is some sort of dimensionality reduction, almost of the subconceptual. Yes, it's, yes, okay. yes. Yeah, so it seems like yeah, you need the dimensions to have the reduced space of those dimensions. Um, so like whenever you whenever I think about this, particularly like you have these three levels and hierarchy, I wonder like what would be the fourth level? But I guess that's not something ah, ah. <laughs> above <laughs> symbolic is not something we can think about by definition, basically. Or no. yeah. yeah, I mean, so your book was published in 2000, as you mentioned. Uh, so that's almost 25 years ago now. And I guess you also call it a research program. Um, which is a fantastic word I'll use whenever I am not, something's not exactly <laughs> figured out yet. Um, but um, yeah, I'm curious, like kind of, it's, yeah, it's been 25 years. We already mentioned some of the grid cell stuff, um, but like, yeah, what are kind of some developments that happened in the last 25 years or something that you think might yeah. happen in the near future? Yeah. Now, to my surprise, it's been applied to a lot of areas. Uh, uh, I was hoping some people would apply it to neuroscience, but it took 20 years before that took off. And, and uh, now, now everybody is talking about spatial representations. I like that very much. Um, it, it's taken off a bit in robotics uh, and uh, AI, and I may say something more about that. But there are other areas. Uh, and, uh, and one area that surprised me quite a lot was in, in, in um, in the geosciences. There was a group in, in, in Münster in, in Germany who started using conceptual spaces to represent geographical concepts about land areas, land types, and so on. And they did a really good work on that. So I, uh, that was a total surprise to me. Yeah, how did they apply it? Do you know? Or... Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't okay. give you an example here, but, but they classif to classify different types of land areas and, and, uh, and uh, Mm -hmm. Whether something is a march or a, a lake or a uh, estuary okay, or okay. A, and so on, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Whether something is a mountain or a hill, I mean that's a simple distinction, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then uh, I wrote the book for philosophers and cognitive scientists, but it's been. Uh, some people in robotics have, have started using the ideas. And I, I'm really happy about that because I think that if you rep stop using only symbolic pro programming and start doing things more in terms of vectors, I mean, programming terms, uh, uh, concepts in terms of vectors, vector spaces, and, and regions in spaces and so on, it will be much easier for a robot to learn a new concept or for an AI system to learn a new concept. I mean, you have these big AI systems based on deep learning and where you, where you train them on, on 100,000 different faces or, or, or whatnot, and then they can recognize new faces. But if you have some kind of dimensional uh, representation of, of the concepts, then I, I think that the learning process could be made much, much quicker in, in, uh, by using these kind of geometrical uh, representations. And then, of course, you can turn that into symbolic representation and... and, and have a new language for for things. I mean, think about dropping a number of, of robots on a, on a distant planet that can't communicate with Earth. They have to find, look at everything new they see, and they have to communicate. They have different senses. They have uh, 
they have uh, cameras and microphones and Geiger method and thermometers and, and, and whatnot. And they have to build up a, some kind of concepts, uh, conceptual representation of what they are experiencing in the world. And they have to communicate about that. I think that would be much quicker if you did it w- w- via some kind of, of dimensional representations. Yeah, and I guess it's especially what you mentioned the, the 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 prototypes and the distant metrics and all that kind of stuff. It seems to me that it's just a very convenient way of, in a way, I mean, like one thing I find really fascinating is that it's just a very efficient way of storing information and and the relationship between uh, all sorts of different things. But yeah, yeah, it makes. I mean, <laughs> I guess it's the whole like AI neuroscience psychology. Uh, back and forth is this idea that if if it's much more efficient for humans to learn that way, then it might also be more efficient and quicker for AI systems to learn that way. Yeah, and I guess I guess also I'd imagine people in AI for them it would be quite natural because you know you you put it between the connectionist model that I suppose is more of the deep learning new stuff. But it it involves different programming methodologies. I mean, you have standard programs for for the symbolic level and you have neural networks for the sub-symbolic. Developing this kind of vector computation and and, um, and Voronoi tessellations and whatnot is is a different kind of programming methodology. But it can be done. I mean, it's not, there is a, it takes a different technique. But that hasn't been developed yet? There are are attempts. There are some uh, cases done, yeah. But it's fairly fairly small so far. Okay, okay. Well, sounds exciting. Whatever's gonna <laughs> whatever's gonna come next in this. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, are you still um, are you mainly working on the semantic aspects, or what are you most in, like personally? What are you most interested in? For- I'm, I'm mainly working on the semantic aspect, but I also have a lot of contact with people in in uh, robotics and AI, and I'm discussing with them. I'm trying to. Uh, show them that that the, these kind of models are, can be useful in in, in AI or robotics. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I'm trying to have a few questions that I asked most guests, and that's kind of largely independent. Although it can obviously you can make it completely relevant to what we talked about. Um, and obviously, because I didn't send you these questions before, <laughs> you can take as much time as you want, and I'll edit it to make it very nice and short. Uh, well, as if there's no pause and you immediately thought of it. Or I can take it out. One question, uh, just in general, is like, what's something that uh, you wish you learned sooner? It can be from academia or science or life, uh, whatever you want. Just some, I don't know, I guess everyone has uh, some mistakes. They're repeated a few times too many. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm curious. Um, Since I became a cognitive scientist via computer science and philosophy. I wish I had a better background in in psychology. And uh, given a a very long life, I would have included neuroscience in that too. But uh, (laughs) uh, that would have probably be too much for a young fellow to to learn about all these things. Uh, But psychology, I mean, the the psychological methods and so on is something I miss. I have a little bit of a background in linguistics, and and I've broadened that later, but uh, still I'm not a linguist. Then uh, from life, I mean, there are, I've had different kinds of hobbies. uh, And uh, if you want to have a really personal thing, I I started with judo when I was 35. Okay. Uh, Yes. uh, And I went on, I really loved that sport and I ended when I was 55. Uh, but I wish I had started that much earlier. I thought it was so fun. It was so great uh, to do to do judo. So uh, that's something I, I wish I had started much earlier with. Uh, why did you stop? I was 55. I, I stopped by taking my the, the black belt. And then my when you take the black belt, you have to do this kata, this choreograph to judo throws. And you have to throw yourself and, and your opponent on the floor hundreds of times you, you practice. So, so my body was simply worn out. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I actually also tried to do um, uh, some martial art, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which I guess is becoming a lot more popular in recent years. I stopped doing it also because I moved and then it was too far away from the good gym, blah, blah, blah. But I, I think I got okay. injured like twice within the first three months. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was also... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that happens probably less if you start earlier with these kind of things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, maybe just briefly about uh, the first point you mentioned about all these different disciplines. And if you, you know, if you had time, you'd learn all the different, you know, neuroscience, psychology, all kind of things. As someone who very much is at the intersection of neuroscience, psychology, and a bit of economics, it does often feel like it's a lot. Uh, so I'm curious, like, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that? Because I guess one difficulty I have in general is this kind of sense, like, you have to learn everything. And uh, I, I deal with it by, by still being very curious and, and reading about a lot of different stuff. I mean, I've actually read quite a lot in economics as well, uh, in particular game theory and deci decision theory in, mo in modern areas. Uh, so I, I try to follow. I, I, I read a lot. I listen to a lot of lectures and I go to seminars and I go to conferences. Uh, so I, I still think of myself as having an open mind and being very curious about everything. I don't. I don't want to let, get locked up in any particular small research question. I mean, I I'd rather take wild blows at the, at the big area than uh, than small and controlled move, movements in a small area. Ending up as your center on a four-legged split. Yeah, uh, just exactly. Accepting yeah, yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the the final question is um, kind of what's an What's an old paper or book that's been overlooked or that you think more people should read? It doesn't necessarily have to be old, mm. but I think there's a lot of very good old papers that people don't read anymore. Um, I don't know if anything comes to mind. There I have to think. This book has been read, but David Marr's book on vision was for me the prime example of how to do cognitive science. I mean, he he had a good background in neuroscience. He had a good background in, in computing, and he developed very very um, good new models, a new way, in a very creative way. I mean, that 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 was for me a one of the real big breakthroughs in, in what can be called cognitive science. Uh, so, I mean, that book is widely read, but I, I still, I, I think we should not for, forget him because he was such a unique person in, in, uh, in creating a new area of, 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 of research. Uh, so that for me, that's one of the prime examples in, within the cognitive sciences. Yeah, that's actually a great example because um, especially, you know, I, uh, as I said before we were recording, I, I did my master's in kind of cognitive competition neuroscience. And there, it feels like every lecture started with David Marr um, because it's, you know, always at three levels. And I think it's a great way of organizing it. Um, but I haven't actually read it. <laughs> I haven't ah, read it. Haven't. Yeah, oh. I've heard it so often that I feel like I <laughs> okay, know it. Okay, yeah. But I haven't actually, I mean, you know, also not exactly doing that, but it's, um, I think this is the perfect... You should read it because, you should read it because, to, in order to follow his, how he builds up his argument. And it's, it's very logical. Okay, in, in retrospect, some of his ideas have been rejected, but his way of, of building up the story is is just amazing. It's, it's really creative, really, really strict and, 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 and well done, yeah? I, I was very impressed by that book. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and read it. I'll do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs>